cave. We enter the cave. Today's video is the first in a series on the interplay between media technology and human identity. Too slow. This is boring. This topic is very important and meaningful to me because as a content creator who's sitting in front of a camera and a microphone and who will edit his own self-expression after the fact. More action. You have to hook their attention and keep it. Well, grab it, hold it. It always makes me wonder what's the impact of this technology on how I express myself, how I present myself. Should I maybe not act like a clown because the clown is gonna push away serious viewers and he's gonna attract non-serious viewers? Should I be more serious? Should I act more seriously? You look like an idiot. Do I enter into a feedback loop with both the technology I use and the audience? Am I susceptible to audience capture? Am I susceptible to altering my image for the sake of likability? I hope not. Of the like button. I hate the like button. The comment function. Popularity. Am I a puppet of YouTube? Oh God, I hope not. You need something that makes people go, <laughs> what the fuck? What the fuck? Of the algorithm. In an ironic twist, in the 21st century, words liberated from the oppression of the church and tyrannical state control in the Western Hemisphere found themselves subjected to algorithms designed to exploit the most primitive psychological biases of the human mind for the sake of capturing people's attention in order to generate profits from advertisement. All these kind of questions are very fascinating to me on a personal level, but also on a collective, because I wonder about Elon Musk, why he acts the way he does. Go yourself. We will get into that in the next video of the series. Like, what does his Twitter profile do with him? It makes him crazy. Where do his ambitions to go to Mars come from? They come from the media. They come from science fiction. How is it possible that someone seemingly as autonomous as Elon Musk has his identity engineered by books and sci-fi movies? How is it possible that he literally believes to live inside of a computer and nobody says anything? All these kind of questions you know, always on my mind, latest since I read Plato's Republic, poetry, according to Plato, the media shape cognitive functions and the self and worldviews and by extension, human behavior. According to Plato, a kind of poetry is possible, a kind of media is possible, which makes people question reality, truth on a more profound level. And then there's the other kind of media, which just draws everyone into an illusion, which is very dangerous. Right, so basically there are two kind of media. The kind which locks you into Plato's cave, which is the Matrix, and the kind of media which liberates you from Plato's cave and leads you out of the Matrix into reality. I'm yet to see the latter. I mostly see illusions. I mostly see shadow plays. I'm actually happy that I found a channel which discusses exactly these topics in a very, very meaningful manner. Best channel on YouTube, other than my own, had to be by a German philosopher, of course. Germans rule. Germans should rule the world. To the German spirit and the pursuit of purity. Prost. The channel is called Carefree Wandering, featuring Professor Möller, a German philosopher who's located in Macau, China. Ni hao. And my video series will heavily build on his categories of human identity, which he calls sincerity, authenticity, and profilicity, and which he presents brilliantly both on his channel and in his book, You and Your Profile. It's really dark. As for this first video today, we're gonna center on the Gutenberg revolution's impact on human self-expression. Make your point. Gutenberg led the Western mind out of the matrix, you know, the world of illusions created by the Catholic media empire. And as a result, you get Nietzsche, who left the cave, felt like God, and came back into the cave, or the matrix, to preach the Übermensch. Where is the lightning to lick you with its tongue? Where is the madness with which you should be cleansed? Behold, I show you the Superman. He is this lightning. He is this madness. Today's video is gonna get increasingly darker and darker as we move down this rabbit hole. So I wanna start with something uplifting and inspiring before we enter the darkness of today's topic. It's really dark. In the digital era of the 21st century, Picture a world where young individuals resemble cybernetically controlled camels, burdened by the weight of their online profiles and the constant barrage of social media algorithms. They wander through a bustling cityscape or a desolate suburban landscape, their faces glued to screens, their ears plugged into a different dimension, disconnected from the real world. 
The surrounding trees wither, their bodies decay, and water is scarce. Yet one day, an individual starts to question the relentless stream of digital demands and decides to unplug. As they disconnect from the oppressive social media cloud, something remarkable occurs. Their vitality is restored, and they find themselves in a rejuvenated oasis within the city, a place where self-reflection and self-discovery thrive. As they drink from the refreshing stream of psychological awakening, their spirit is revived, and their body, along with their self-confidence, grows stronger and healthier. No longer do they walk as burdened camels. They stand tall as empowered, fiery lions, ready to confront the challenges of their time. They face the colossal digital dragon of identity engineering social media technology, roaring with defiance. Flames of self-expression and independence burst forth from their very being as they challenge the digital dragon for control over their destiny. And then they conquer it. After vanquishing the digital dragon and reclaiming control over their identity, our empowered lion doesn't halt their journey. They recognize that to truly thrive in the modern world, they must take another step. They choose to embrace their inner child as they do, a sense of innocence and wonder returns. They begin to see the digital realm as a playground for creativity rather than a burden. Their once fiery determination now propels a new beginning like a wheel rolling out of itself. With playfulness and curiosity, they start inventing new values and ideas. They create, experiment, and dare to challenge the established norms of the digital world. They comprehend that genuine freedom lies not merely in rebellion, but in the ability to shape their own destiny. As you will see throughout today's video, I will implicitly argue that Nietzsche's Übermensch was the peak of authentic self-expression, and that authentic self-expression has since declined as we have moved into the era of profilicity. But first, we have to start with a very, very brief summary of Professor Möller's three categories of human identity, sincerity, authenticity, and profilicity. In media theory, the famous but often misattributed quote, we shape our tools and thereafter they shape us, holds a central place, emphasizing that media is not merely a storage device, but a mold for our identities. In traditional societies, a person's identity was closely intertwined with their societal role, and the tools they employed played a pivotal role in defining them. For instance, a farmer's identity was linked to their plows and sickles, a knight's to their sword and shield, and a blacksmith's to their hammer and anvil. These roles were frequently determined by one's caste or birth, dictating the type of identity one would assume, whether that of a king or a servant. People embraced these assigned roles wholeheartedly, embodying them with sincerity as they faithfully adhered to the societal designations. The advent of modernity ushered in a new concept, authenticity, emphasizing individuality and originality. Tools became less role-specific, accessible to all, reflecting this shift towards personal expression. Mass media, including novels, provided individuals with a means to explore and express their authenticity, often through narratives of rebellion against conformity. However, the role of media in identity formation is multifaceted. In the 20th century, theorists debated whether media enhances or diminishes authentic living. Some philosophers critiqued media as tools of distraction and exploitation, asserting that they failed to liberate individuals and contributed to a loss of genuine identity. This complexity gives rise to the authenticity paradox. In our pursuit of authenticity, we often look up to individuals or models we perceive as authentic. Paradoxically, by imitating them, we unintentionally become replicas or copies of their authenticity, resulting in inauthenticity. When we consider media, we find that it inherently deals with reproductions, duplicates and copies. Indeed, when we engage with media, we enter a realm that even transcends the conventional authenticity-inauthenticity dichotomy. 
Media doesn't necessarily make us inauthentic. Rather, it encourages us to be non-authentic as we imitate representations of authenticity that may not be genuinely authentic. Furthermore, in the 21st century, media's role isn't solely about fostering authenticity, but about creating exhibition value. We shape our identities as profiles, akin to celebrities or brands, a process referred to as profilicity by Professor Muller. This concept extends beyond online presence, influencing our offline interactions. We increasingly perform for an unseen general audience, shaping our identities in both virtual and real worlds. We act with the awareness of second-order observation, considering if our actions are attractive to our target audience and capable of retaining their attention. This renders our identity neither sincere, as we no longer faithfully embody societal roles, nor authentic, as we do not necessarily embark on a journey of self-discovery before expressing ourselves. We become mere profiles, shaped by the media we use. These media aren't merely communication tools, they are instruments of identity construction. With these three categories in mind, we're going to develop this series. And if you need a deeper explanation, I suggest you hop over to Professor Muller's channel, Carefree Wondering, and you watch the video that I will link in the description below, which is a perfect summary of his theory of identity. He summarizes media theory in a way that's incredibly compressed, comprehensive, and engaging at the same time. In this next part, I'm connecting Nietzsche's Übermensch with the Gutenberg Revolution. We will see how the Gutenberg Revolution essentially released the German self, but by extension, the Western self from the Catholic media empire's grip on identity and how the decentralization of writing as a technology of self-creation by means of, you know, the word led to Nietzsche's Übermensch as the ultimate representation of authentic self-expression in the West. In the second half of the 15th century, a profound transformation in humanity's relationship to the word took place. The invention of the Gutenberg Press. It was a technological revolution that not only revolutionized the dissemination of knowledge, but also had a profound impact on the very concept of human identity. Since the decline of the Roman Empire, the Catholic Church held sway as the primary media network and thus identity engineering institution of Europe. Its authority permeated every aspect of society, defining roles, beliefs, and even individual identities. The Church's teachings and prescribed roles were the cornerstone of sincerity, where conformity and adherence to established norms were the highest virtues. But then, in the midst of the 15th century, Johannes Gutenberg unveiled his revolutionary invention, the printing press. With it came the ability to mass produce books and disseminate knowledge on an unprecedented scale. This technological marvel posed a significant challenge to the Catholic Church's quasi-monopoly on content production, distribution and interpretation, and it enabled its reformation by Martin Luther in the form of Protestantism. Luther, by elevating scripture to the pinnacle of the Protestant attention hierarchy, laid the groundwork for the German Enlightenment and Hegel's absolute idealism. This move transcended scripture, the physical manifestations of words on paper and in books, and acknowledged the dialectic between attention and the word itself as the ultimate source of human self-consciousness. This is very clear from the demand Zola Scriptura, or Bible only. According to Luther, the Catholic religious hierarchies, institutions, and traditions were impure additions to the pure, original essence of Christianity, which was found purely only in the Bible. So the idea was basically to get rid of all those more or less corrupt social and political practices and cults and beliefs, for instance, in saints, that had no explicit basis in the Bible. 
Let me quickly step in to visually emphasize the significance of this evolution based on Hegel's student Heinrich Heine's interpretation. He thought that Luther's insistence on scripture only not just lifted the Bible to the peak of Christian attention by eliminating the Catholic Church as broker between the believer and the content of the Bible, but that Luther also paved the way for the transcendence of the Bible and the recognition of the dialectic of attention and the word as such as source of self-consciousness. The idea is perhaps that you can only transcend that which most immediately frames your consciousness, your attention, first the church, then the Bible, and then you're left with the word itself, ultimately. During the period of philosophical idealism's expansion throughout Germany, another significant movement known as Romanticism also flourished. Romanticism was characterized by a profound appreciation for human emotions, individuality, and the mystical aspects of human experience. This poetic and artistic movement celebrated the power of imagination, emotions, and fostered a deep connection with both nature and the supernatural. It was also deeply influenced by the French Revolution and the idea of the self-determined individual. The concept of authenticity began to take hold. No longer were individuals solely confined by the roles dictated by the church or their positions in a monarchical society. Once restricted to the clergy, a larger part of the population slowly gained access to the wealth of diverse ideas and perspectives emerging from the decentralization of writing, challenging the established norms and fostering a sense of personal agency. Books, once a rare and precious commodity, became more accessible to a broader audience. People could explore a multitude of viewpoints, embark on intellectual journeys, and engage in the pursuit of the identities conveyed by this colorful explosion in human self-expression. This marked the beginning of an age where individuals could shape their identities not only by consuming a broader spectrum of knowledge and thought, but also by producing their own internal visions and dreams. The shift of power over human identity, from the concentration within the church to the individual, facilitated by the technological decentralization of the creative use of language, culminates dramatically about half a millennium later in Nietzsche's Thus Spake Zarathustra. This book can be seen as a modern scripture, Nietzsche's New Testament, introducing the successor to Jesus Christ, the Übermensch, which means overman or superman. Where is the lightning to lick you with its tongue? Where is the madness with which you should be cleansed? Behold, I show you the superman, he is this lightning, he is this madness. The Übermensch is Nietzsche's response to Christ as the West's role model of the ideal individual. Rather than being defined by moral attributes, he is solely characterized by the will to power. We could say that this will to power, which is something like humanity's drive to overcome external and internal limitations, a kind of self-transformative energy, is on the personal level, the courage to transcend sincerity, that is, externally imposed roles, goals, and ideals. It is the ascent to psychological power over one's identity, so to speak. As an ideal embodiment of this will, the Übermensch represents a kind of self-contained deity, a god onto himself, and therefore, the epitome of authenticity, the ultimate original, devoid of specific attributes. We could go so far and say, the definition of this person is madness. As the transcendence of any externally engineered identity, this means absolute potential of becoming, a void of being, and thus, chaos. chaos. Unless the Übermensch assumes a new, self-defined role of sincerity to counterbalance his unlimited potential, his infinite originality, with something which limits him by connecting him to tools and to some kind of function in society. Unfortunately, we are left without a clear definition of how the Übermensch ought to rule the world. His only proper societal function, evidently, given that he is practically God. 
Perhaps because the Übermensch himself, rather than his prophet Friedrich Nietzsche, is to define his own values and impose them on the world as he sees fit. In any case, Nietzsche's Superman remained undefined, awaiting orderly representation and persona in the 20th century. All right, so I'm actually watching this with you and whenever I feel like I should say something, I'm just gonna pause the video and I'm gonna say my two cents and you know, to contextualize or to correct or to expand on something that's been said. All these texts have been written by me, but I use AI generated voices just for the sake of drama. I, I feel like it's more dramatic, it's more impactful, it's more powerful, plus the music, plus the AI images. I just feel like it breathes life into my essay-like texts, right? I could read them to you, but I feel like this is more powerful, essentially. I feel like this is didactically more valuable. It feels better to me anyways. I feel like you just very authentically expressed how you prefer being inauthentic over authentic as you transmit your authentic thoughts. Anyways, I feel like we have to make this whole argument explicit now. Let's quickly rewind to the key section of the previous part and then let me add a piece from my video essay on Nietzsche which you can find on this channel. The shift of power over human identity from the concentration within the church to the individual facilitated by the technological decentralization of the creative use of language culminates dramatically about half a millennium later in Nietzsche's Thus Spake Zarathustra. This book can be seen as a modern scripture, Nietzsche's New Testament introducing the successor to Jesus Christ, the Übermensch, which means Overman or Superman. This aspect is often overlooked in his biographies and philosophical writings. The death of God signified that humanity had to step into the void and take on this role, or at least attempt to. The death of God also marked the moment when humanity had to take control of its destiny. Instead of worshiping a human-made God image, the future of religion lay in worshipping the essence of self. Eternal recurrence, eternal transformation, eternal change, the will to power. Okay, so here's the thing. Like, this is, this is going to be mind-blowing to some, but it's like, what's the ultimate consequence of the Gutenberg Revolution? Gutenberg and Nietzsche summarized. The Gutenberg Revolution decentralizes the consumption of the written word, right? Mass production of books means mass literacy. Basically, everyone learns to read in the 19th century. Everyone learns to write. The complete decentralization of writing and the simultaneous decline of religious authority over the written word, over the creative usage of language, empowers the individual not just to establish their own sincere relationship to the Christian God, as the Bible is no longer brokered, mediated by the Catholic Church, after Luther's Reformation, but it actually empowers every individual to create their own God. And that's what Nietzsche did. He transcended any patterns of religious sincerity. Like he was completely unburdened by any social filter. He was alone in the Alps. He was like on top of the highest mountain in the world, metaphorically speaking, above humanity, above the past, above any patterns. And he became who he was, unlimited, infinite. Rather than being defined by moral attributes, he is solely characterized by the will to power. We could say that this will to power, which is something like humanity's drive to overcome external and internal limitations, a kind of self-transformative energy, is, on the personal level, the courage to transcend sincerity. That is, externally imposed roles, goals, and ideals. As the transcendence of any externally engineered identity, this means absolute potential of becoming. Well, that's my reading anyways. And he wanted to transmit that. Instead of creating a Jesus Christ-like role model who acted in a certain way, who, was, who embodied certain moral patterns, a certain way of life, he was like, no, become who you are by following me by following me into self-transcendence, such that you can become who you are. Infinite, eternal fire, the child which can invent new values after it has surpassed the camel. 
So in some sense, what's really ironic about Nietzsche is that while he's the peak of self-expression, while he's the only one, as far as I know, who dares to create a Jesus Christ 2.0, the Übermensch, we don't actually see too many gods emerging later on in the 20th century, let alone in the 21st century. You could have assumed that by liberating human self-expression, by freeing poets from any sort of, you know, control exerted by religion, by the state, by society, by the family, a colorful explosion of God figures would take place in the 20th century. Somehow that did not happen. To me personally, it's really astonishing, but also frustrating because the only thing we saw emerge were transhumanists, people who got bitten by spiders and people who use technology to enhance themselves like Iron Man and Batman. The only human superhero of the 20th century, the way I read it is the Joker who's not a superhero, but a supervillain. I could go on a rant here because it's, fr it's really frustrating to me personally. The way freedom of expression is being thrown away, you know, to any philosopher, this has to be outrageous. I mean, Socrates literally sacrificed himself. He, he literally chose to die for the individual's right to define their own God. Like, that's what it was all about. Like, he, he went against the gods of Athens. And now we have the right to, in some sense, in some sense, Nietzsche went mad creating his own god on paper. And, well, like that was his message. If you ask yourself, what's the message of Nietzsche? What's the, what's the essence of Nietzsche? The essence of Nietzsche is that he tried to, to create a new god. Like that's Nietzscheanism, if you will. To follow Nietzsche is not to follow Nietzsche's Jesus Christ, Zarathustra, but it's to create your own Jesus Christ by following Nietzsche. The Übermensch represents a kind of self-contained deity, a god onto himself, and therefore the epitome of authenticity. Could be a woman, could be gay. It can take any form you authentically feel like your god should take on. And yet somehow that did not happen. It's completely unbelievable to me. It's completely incredible. <sighs> Honestly, obviously, my knowledge of what happened in the literary world is very limited. So if you can direct me to any incredible God figure emerging out of Nietzsche other than Superman, which, by the way, in my last video, I showed you what the original Superman looked like. And I showed you like what it did to America. And like, if you can direct me to anyone who, to, to any God figures emerging out of post Nietzsche, compelling God figures, you know, I, I'd appreciate it. Um, but anyways, in, in the coming section, we will see how, what happened to, like, what actually happened in the 20th century from my point of view is that creative self-expression, the creative usage of language became subjected to the profit motive, which in turn motivated people to create copies of previously economically successful patterns instead of creating originals, instead of creating gods. It's like, it's so frustrating. It's so frustrating because it's like, I can't watch anything. I actually can't watch anything. Because it's not, it's not Nietzschean. Because it's not transcending. It's always just copies of 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 copies. It drives me nuts. Like this is my authentic self. My authentic self is angry at the world. It's as angry as philosophers for allowing Elon Musk, perhaps the closest representation of Nietzsche's Übermensch in the 21st century. We'll get to that in the next video to allow him to believe that he literally lives inside of a computer. I mean, imagine, imagine Alexander the Great believed that he literally lived inside of an olive press. It's like Aristotle would have committed suicide, honestly.
It's like unbelievable, unbelievable. So that's my relationship to philosophy in the 21st century. In case you were to ask, that's the answer I would give you. Elon Musk believes to live inside of a computer. What the fuck? And my relationship to poetic expression, to content production, to films, to, to, to shows. It's like, where the, fuck, where the fuck are the Nietzsche gods? It's like, why do I only see fucking Spider-Man in 10 different versions? It's like, where are your gods? Poets of the world, where are your gods? You're allowed to. It's like, why do you not take advantage of this freedom? Or put differently, why do you not assume responsibility for this kind of freedom of expression, which other people died for, such that you could have it now? Socrates. Anyways, let me stop here. Fuck authenticity. Perhaps the media have never been a tool of the enlightenment, a harbinger of the revolution in the space of sovereign individuality. Instead, we will see at the end of this series, the media may turn out to have been, from the start, something very different, an amplifier of second order observation complex way of seeing and showing ourselves that is pushing us beyond the age of authenticity and into the age of profilicity. <laughs>